So I think in the interest of time, we'll get started. Uh, on behalf of my or organizers, co-organizers, Professor Ramesh Kari, Gary, myself, Hammond Pierce, uh, I want to welcome everybody to today's panel discussion on additive manufacturing security. And the panel is focused on design materials and sensor-based solutions. We want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for providing funding to make these events possible. This is a third panel discussion under the theme of additive manufacturing security. The first event was focused on intellectual property protection. The second event was focused on diversity and inclusion. And those recordings are now available on YouTube. The next event will be scheduled for November 5. And uh, it will be focused on cybersecurity issues in manufacturing. So we have partnered with IEEE for that event. And we hope that you will be able to join uh, uh, this whole series. So I wanted to highlight one more event, which is uh, Hack 3D. The registration is now open, the challenge is available. And this is a competition related to hacking security in additive manufacturing. Uh, the design files are available. These design files have some sort of uh, design-based encryption. And if you are a puzzle solver or mechanical engineering uh, student or professional, you can go there and you can try to solve this um, this challenge. Students will win prizes. We don't have prizes for the professional teams. Uh, the, the challenge is available through NYU Center for Cybersecurity website. And this brings me to today's panel. We have three wonderful panelists with us. And uh, the panelists will be uh, Dr. Justin Scott of TMS, the Minerals, Metals and Materials Society. We want to thank TMS for partnering for this event. Dr. Justin Scott is the Department Head for Research, Engagement, Data, and Information at TMS. He oversees the application of data analytics to advance the TMS initiatives and activities. He also serves as the principal editor for the Society's flagship journal, JOM. Previously, Justin was a research staff member at the IDA Science and Technology Policy Institute in Washington, DC. There he performed policy research and analysis in support of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Defense on the topic of including advanced manufacturing, critical materials, and supply chain and R&D investments. He obtained his PhD in material science and engineering from Northwestern University in 2010. I want to sincerely thank him for agreeing to moderate this panel. And uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Justin. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Professor Gupta, and, and thank you for this invitation to participate. Uh, so, you know, as you mentioned, uh, one of the hats that I wear uh, when working at the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society is that of Principal Editor of JOM. Um, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with that journal, we publish timely topics of special interest to the materials community. So I think it's, uh, this is a really uh, terrific fit. Um, you know, I'm, I'm quite pleased to be moderating uh, this panel because security and manufacturing, especially with this focus that we have today on design, uh, materials and sensor-based solutions is something that I think is a rapidly um, growing uh, topic. There's an increasing recognition about the importance uh, that it has on the field. And, and so I'm really excited to dive into today's discussion. Uh, as you mentioned, we, we have a really esteemed panel of subject matter experts on the topic. They're going to take uh, up to five minutes each to introduce themselves, um, maybe provide a little bit of their uh, initial perspectives on the topic uh, of security and manufacturing. And um, then we'll go ahead and, and dive into the group discussion. So at the outset, I want to remind you that as uh, attendees, you have the chance to influence today's discussion by submitting your questions in the Q&A box, uh, should be at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to as many of the questions uh, as we can. Um, and I'm looking forward to a very lively discussion. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and I'm gonna hand things over to our panelists. And the first one we're gonna start with is Eric McDonald. Okay, can you hear me? I'm hoping. I thank you for inviting me and I'm, I'm excited to participate. I'd like to share my screen. Let's see. Can you see? Okay. So I'd like to start by showing um, some of the research I'm doing on binder jetting of sand molds. What you're seeing here is an X1 binder jetting and it's printing sand. And this is uh, really new to me, uh, probably in the last four years. 
What I'm known for is interrupting 3D printing processes and interjecting uh, electronics to do 3D printed electronics. But I went to Youngstown State four years ago because it's you know the backyard university of America makes and they have a foundry which you're seeing here and that is a 3D printed sand mold. They're pouring metal in, it's disposable, 24 hours later we can pop out and we can make um, basically very complex geometries based on digital data and you can see a, a lattice to the right. And so I've been working with a lot of different companies uh, to investigate ways of improving this. And as uh, I should tell you that I'm not at Youngstown State any longer. I just started at the University of Texas at El Paso. I'm a double E, but my research has always been in the last 20 years on additive manufacturing. And uh, I'm returning to the University of Texas El Paso in the mechanical engineering department, which is a little odd. Um, and I'm also the editor of the journal Additive Manufacturing, which is published by Elsevier. And I encourage any of you to talk to me if you're doing additive manufacturing research and you'd like to publish in that venue. And then let me get to, so again, I'm an electrical engineer. So what you're seeing here on the top is 3D printed sand uh, of a core that would be suspended into a mold. And that mold uh, would have a cavity that would fill with molten metal. And so what I'm trying to do is take this 3000 year old industry and juice it with wireless disposable sensors. And this is where the cybersecurity element comes in. And you see this dialog IOT sensor, it's got pressure, temperature, uh, magnetic field, acceleration, rotation, humidity. We're putting these sensors into cores and then we're capping them off, gluing them in basically, so that they're protected at least temporarily from the molten metal, you know, and understanding that these things are going to die in about 120 seconds, but they're going to capture data that's really never been captured before. Um, and at $45 a pop, these things are not inexpensive, but they're inexpensive enough to be considered disposable. And there's a whole slew of publications if you're interested in reading more about this, but the idea is to collect data from very remote and hard to access locations within a mold. In one of our first papers, you can see some of the different things we've measured. Uh, we pour the metal and we get about 120 seconds of data. We see things like uh, core shift. We can tell the, the presence of metal in di different locations. Pressure is something we're doing right now. The, the diagram on the bottom shows those two sensors you just saw. And in each case, the pressure goes up and down as the binder decomposes. And this can generate a defect if the pressures get high enough and inject air into the, the molten metal. And so again, I'm an electrical engineer and this is magnesium. I probably shouldn't have been this close, but you can see my cell phone on the top of this and it's reading data from a Bluetooth sensor deep inside of this mold. Um, and I'm gonna swing around and get a better view of it. But the idea is that this access to this data is just unprecedented and um, a little dangerous maybe. You can see there's cracks on my phone. I can tell you that that was not related to this, but I've had at least one student drop a phone into molten metal and it's an unpleasant experience to say the least. Um, but you get this sense that we're now collecting data, it's wireless. So somebody that could be in close proximity could potentially capture this data. So again, something we haven't really started to explore until recently is the idea of protecting the proprietary information that could be, you know, it could really reveal a lot about the process that you're doing and so forth. And just to give you a sense of the sort of landscape of IoT, we've got dialogue IoT sensor on the left. That's what you saw in those videos. We're moving really more to Raspberry Pis because they're really a fully operational Linux computer and it, they can serve up a website. You know, we can download different libraries, do analysis locally inside the mold. And uh, we're really, they're a little too big. They're cheap, but they're big. And so we're making customized Raspberry Pis that we can shrink to increase the battery life um, reduce the footprint and then customize for whatever sensors we think are appropriate for a given experiment. And so this is a, one of our first versions, I'll say that much, but uh, the idea that these things are with Wi-Fi, with Bluetooth, with sub one gigahertz, which is another protocol that can actually go miles uh, in a radio that's run on a coin cell battery. Uh, the thought that this could be ex an exposure uh, is, is 
definitely a concern. It's a vulnerability and it's something that we're, we're writing proposals on currently to explore in more depth. And I, that's what I had to say on my background. I'm really an additive person, but cybersecurity clearly is, uh, you know, critical and, and something that we're very worried about. So I'll hand it off. Great, thank you, Eric. So I'm gonna take just a quick second here um, and, and use moderator's privilege to ask uh, a clarifying question. So I'm not as familiar with the sand casting process. Um, but I'm guessing that there are some feature size limitations when you take that approach. I'm just wondering, can you tell, give me a little bit of sense of that scale, um, you know, because that I think also will drive some of the sensor, um, you know, some the sensor locations and positioning as well. So the actual technology for printing the molds is based on ink jetting. And the very first video I, sh I showed, it scrapes sand onto the layer, ink jets down, selectively binding the sand. That's precise. I mean, that goes down to 100 microns. We're probably more limited by the particle size of the sand. But then when you saw that one core coming down, the bigger concern for us is we have to have at least a couple of centimeters of sand to protect the electronics, depending on how long you want them to last. You, you can have uh, a sensor that's maybe, you know, 20 or 30 centimeters away that could survive and be reused. Uh, in that example, those electronics were completely destroyed being an inch away from the molten metal. And that's probably the biggest limitation. So the obtrusiveness of the sensors. So we want these as small as possible so that we can, yeah. And then depending on how long you want them to survive, those are the limitations. Does that clarify? Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna keep things moving. And uh, next up for the panelists, we have Jian Yu. Thank you. This is Jian Yu from the uh, Army Research Laboratory. So currently I'm the uh, team leader for uh, looking into research in printed electronics and embedding these printed electronics inside a structure for military applications. Uh, the application is similar to uh, what Eric is doing, except that we want that uh, device to survive. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit different. We still encapsulate in a in a structure. It still sends temperature, you know, sense of vibration, but it still has to survive, you know, high G loading, high temperature loading. Um, so also, of course, it's going to emit, you know, signal RF uh, signal to a, a receiver, you know, to get the telemetry, you know, to get the GPS coordinate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And security, of course, become an issue. How do you um, make a secure uh, communication between the device that you built and the receiver, the intended receiver. So this is a very in, in important question as we uh, approach this uh, additive manufacturing uh, space, because this is something new, something that you know, we haven't very thought, uh, thoroughly thought through, um, because uh, in, in, in printing, anything can go wrong and you know you can have someone can hack into the print file and make some adjustment and you'll be exposed to vulnerabilities so i'm happy to join this uh, panel discussion and i uh, hope to learn more about what we can do to prevent uh hacking thank you terrific thank you so much so uh the last panelist that we have today uh, is Dirk Lemus, and so I'll hand things over to you so you can introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much uh, also to Nikhil for the kind introduction um, or invitation to join this panel. Um, I have a few slides to share, just like Eric. Um, I'm just trying to put it on the screen. Um, let me see. Okay. So basically, um, I hope you can see my screen now. My personal background is um, mechanical engineering and materials technology, and I'm working at the Fraunhofer Institute for Manufacturing Technology and Advanced Materials in Bremen in Germany. Um, Fraunhofer may be known, it's the largest organization in Europe for applied research and development services. We have something like 28,000 employees at the moment, and IFAM is one of about 70 institutes in this uh, kind of conglomerate. So um, what we are doing is applied research and what we are doing specifically in our institute is, um, well, research on the following topics, which you can see on this screen here. So sintering compound and cellular materials. This is also where I originally come from, having written my PhD about metal foams. 
Powder technology and sintering processes, this also includes additive manufacturing, of course. I will detail that a little bit further. Casting technology, which is the department where I'm currently located, and uh, some other topics which I will not go into detail about in this presentation here, electric components and systems for electric powertrain of vehicles, fiber reinforced materials, service technology, and adhesive bonding. So, as I said, um, the areas I am most connected to are basically powder technology and casting technology. So, casting technology is my current home, and it was quite nice to see that Eric McDonald already uh, kind of linked these two topics with his presentation, so I can basically follow up on that. Saying first a few words about uh, what we do, what we have in terms of um, additive manufacturing at IFAM, different locations, both in Bremen and in Dresden. Um, we have equipment for laser beam melting, we have uh, equipment for electron beam melting, we have metal binder jetting, 3D metal printing, which is basically a, a screen printing process, which is adapted um, using a kind of metal powder based feedstock um, to create three dimensional structures. And we use uh, fused filament fabrication also to produce um, additively manufactured structures. And, uh, most of the processes I'm talking about here are seen in view of producing metallic parts. That's also my home, basically, metals. So uh, metal binder jetting is currently a process we look at in very much detail. We are acquiring more and more X1 machines for this. Um, this is basically because, of course, there's a lot of interest in laser beam melting anyway. And metal binder jetting, on the other hand, is something which is related to other areas of research we have here in powder technology, like, for example, metal injection molding. So metal binder jetting, you also have a binder. You have a quite large amount of binder. You have to remove it, and uh, you have to sinter your part afterwards to get a fully dense, full density metal part. So there's a relation between these processes in some steps. And this is why metal binder jetting is currently a big research focus at our institute. So coming to the casting area um, where I'm currently in, um, just to show you the process that we have, we have high pressure die casting equipment, um, well, industrial scale, I would say. So uh, the machines are smaller than uh, what Tesla does at the moment with their gigapress, but uh, we still have 600 tons of locking force roughly. We do low pressure die casting. We also do investment casting and we do injection molding um, to support the investment casting make, uh, mainly to produce the wax models. And we can also do a little bit of uh, lost foam casting, sand casting, gravity die casting, just as you've seen it in Eric's presentation. So how does this link to um, cyber security? Well, we have different approaches which basically link to this topic, both in the casting and the additive manufacturing field. And this is just showing a few of the examples here. Um, a lot of this goes in the direction of authentication of parts, uh, like, for example, RFID integration, both in AM parts and in uh, metal casting parts. We also have approaches towards sensor integration, both, again, in additive manufacturing and in metal casting. You see that here on the top left corner. So we use a substrate, we produce a sensor on that using thick film or thin film techniques and we integrate that in the part. We have also less smart authentication techniques, which are also based in this case on 3D printing. Um, basically in this case, what you see on the lower right hand side here are um, QR codes, which are produced by means of the screen printing process I mentioned earlier and integrated in metal castings for identification. So you can't really see them from the outside, but they're inside there and they help you to identify so personally, um, of course, if you have any questions, you can also contact me later on. Um, personally, in terms of additive manufacturing, I may add that I have a specific interest in multi-material processes. And this is something um, which we try to combine both with the laser beam melting process, but currently also specifically with the binder jetting process. The idea there is to use the uh, binder as a kind of carrier medium for introducing additives to the part. Well, having said that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and well, I'll be looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. All right, so um, before we dive into things, I just wanna uh, remind everyone uh, who's attending today uh, that if you have any questions, you can submit them via the Q&A box. Um, but I guess just to go ahead and kick things off with the panelists, 
uh, you know, so we've been talking a lot so far about embedded sensors and, you know, kind of, you know, things that are embedded with inside a 3D printed part. Um, how does that impact the ultimate performance of the part itself? You know, at what point are you starting to think, um, you know, about the um, design elements? Is it, you know, I've got a sensor and then I've got this part, you know, can you talk a little bit about um, the design piece of that and then how you're trying to uh, reduce the impact on performance at the end? So can I start or? How Please. It? Okay. So it, like I just had mentioned, uh, we're doing a study right now where we have four cores of sand that are suspended into a, a cavity. And we're trying to actually measure the pressure. And in each of the cores, we have different ventilation. So the beauty of this 3D printing sand mold approach is that we can actually put you know, fluidic channels or openings or ventilation uh, to not allow the gas to build up in these cores that might be what we call pathologically you know, pathological geometries where the metal surrounds the core, decomposes the binder, causes pressure, and that pressure can cause defects in the metal. And um, one of the problems we faced, I think, in, in this approach is that, and it's the question you had just uh, posed, is that there's a limitation to the size of the core. You know, some cores are just like soda straws and are very small and, and are meant to put fluidic channels in the casting. And so those are a challenge, obviously, because you want the electronics to be in there, but it might have to you know, be prohibitively small. So there's a limit to you know, how small a, a core or a mold can be in sand casting if you do want to get that data. So that's one aspect. Now, that's really only about 20% of my research. You know, I started putting electronics into plastic objects. And there, we weren't necessarily too concerned with the strength. They weren't really load-bearing structures. Uh, and we just enjoyed the freedom of being able to place electronics in arbitrary positions. And I could show you more slides on that, uh, but I wanted to focus on sand casting. And then we had, uh, I had just worked with the University of Bremen um, doing a sensor in a laser cladding directed energy deposition process where we made tensile bars. But while we built them, we inserted a sensor and then built over them. And about only 20% of them could survive that high temperature process that proceeded. Uh, but these were ceramic screen printed sensors that were durable and some did survive. But of course the tensile bar now has a sensor where it shouldn't have a sensor, right? Internally, like a ship in the bottle. That's cool, but at the same time, it clearly you know, compromised the structural integrity because you had at least one surface that would have been consolidated and wasn't. So that's definitely a concern that, but I think there may be applications where we might be 3D printing a lattice and have these different sensors sort of embedded inside or even on the surfaces of struts inside the lattice where you wouldn't have access normally. And, you know, it's definitely a concern. And we're trying to find applications where adding the sensors isn't a compromise, uh, but very often it is. And it's just uh, something we have to take into account. I don't know, I think, I, that was probably a pretty broad answer, but yeah. Yeah, basically, maybe I can add a few words. I mean, um, it's a, a multifaceted problem, actually. Huh? So you have uh, the sensor, which uh, is, of course, uh, in many cases, uh, meant to gather strain data, for example, to estimate the load that's actually on the material. So you want to see something. You want to see some signal. And this basically means that um, you have to put the sensor in a location where at least some stress occurs. Uh, but on the other hand, the sensor is potentially a disruption of the material, so a weakness. So you have to balance that, of course. You can do that a lot, uh, I think, by design. You can, uh, of course, um, evaluate uh, the local loads within your part and uh, select a position which, for one thing, gives you a, a good signal. On the other hand, a signal which is not disturbed by noise too much and which also allows you to clearly identify the state of the part as a whole. But still, specifically if you're talking about metal parts, um, which is the case with us, you have a, level, a number of interfaces which you need to consider. You have uh, usually a substrate on which you deposit your sensor beforehand um, when you integrate it. Um, then if you go for a part of that based process, for example, then usually you insert your sensor into a cavity in this part. So there's not necessarily a full area connection there. And then if the metal, uh, the substrate that you originally deposited your sensor on 
is also metal, then you need also insulation layers. Mm? So uh, you have a multi-layer structure really, which is integrated. And you have lots of potential points for failure. So that needs to be taken into account in design of the part and also in the layout of the system as a whole. Great discussion. So I, I want to bring in Jeanne, if we can, a little bit. And, um, you know, you had mentioned your interest in really trying to extend the life of these sensors as much as possible. So what has been your approach in order to help um, try and promote that as much as possible? Right. So at our research project, um, we try to actually integrate and print these uh, sensors as part of the structure. So it become part of the conformal printing space inside a, a particular structure. So as long as the uh, substrate material, let's say the, uh, the body of the material survive this high G loading and uh, high temperature, and then we can print uh, this electronic circuits minus the MEMS device, of course, you know, or the MEMS device we can't, we can't print, um, but we can print uh, uh, resistors, we can print capacitors, we can print the whole circuit. Um, so those are part, become part of the interior um, of the sensor that become part of the structure. So we are testing these devices in high G loading environment as well as a high temperature uh, application. So we see some of the uh, success uh, story coming out uh, from our research. So that's our strategy, just that, okay, it become part of the structure rather than separate. Great. Just to understand if I may uh, ask a question here, um, which processes are you actually using? And is it metal or poly polymers in this case? Uh, we use every, every method available for us. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we, you know, we, we use, uh, uh, fabric sonic, we can ultrasound welding the, some of the metals. Uh, okay. we, yeah, and then we use the uh, aerosol jet to print some of the electronic pads. And we use all different kinds of process and different material and try to integrate them into another uh, multi-platform additive uh, capability. That's what we try to do here. So the final part uh, originates from a combination of different processes. Yes, exactly. Yes, you try to combine everything. Yeah. And I should point out that that Fabrosonic process is really fascinating because it's ultrasonically, you know, adhering different layers of aluminum tape or whatever metal, and it's a low temperature metal process where you get great metallurgical bonds. So I think that's just fascinating. I think that might be one of the best additive approaches for embedded sensors because you're not doing what I did, which was shoot a laser at it and heat it up to uh, 2,500 degrees and yeah, very yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. We, we try to uh, make sure that the device survives uh, during the manufacturing process. Right. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So that actually leads to a great question that just came in um, from the one of uh, the attendees today. And so, you know, we're talking a lot about, you know, some really cool, neat advancements in um, additive manufacturing. You're just talking about Fabrosonic, you know, lots of things that are advancing there. On the sensor side of things, how are, how, you know, how is innovation progressing such that it is also keeping pace with all of the changes that are happening in the additive manufacturing processes and the availability of different approaches out there? Can I start again? Sure. My first on the list. So I, I deal with a lot of different sensors. Uh, clearly the sand casting, we're using commercial sensors and they continue to get smaller and smaller and better and better just because they're driven by the cell phone industry, I, I would presume. That little dialogue sensor had uh, three different Bosch sensors that are, are just tiny and very accurate. And, uh, and, and so I use that in that context. But then in other context, uh, we try to print the sensor like the the project that I did with the University of Bremen, which is of course tied to Dirk in, in the front offer there. But um, in that case, we're making them ourselves. And then just this year, I published a paper where we're working with the National Football League. This is not metals, this is plastics, but elastomers, soft elastomers that are very durable, that are being used in like the Adidas shoes and the New Balance shoes that are coming out that have lattices. And I have a paper where just by putting, interweaving a wire at one layer and a wire at another layer, I was able to do a capacitive sensor basically. And in thinking about how that might impact the performance, um, it's a soft, you know, elastomer uh, 
lattice that can absorb energy. So it could go into a football helmet or into a shoe. And the wires are pretty unobtrusive. And there you can get a little microcontroller, a silicon die even, and a coin cell battery, and you can measure the capacitance between them to, to get a sense of deformation. So that's not really even a commercial sensor, it's just two wires and a microcontroller. Uh, but so there's all, it's really hard to answer that question because you've got everything from commercial sensors, which are amazing, to printed sensors, which I think is a great area of research. And then even doing things like capacitive sensing and just using a wire, a couple wires, to measure distance of, of or even a, the impact uh, energy in a hit in on a football field. So, if I could turn the question around, uh, what I would wish for would be cheap high temperature sensors. <laughs> yeah, right. High temperature resistance, because uh, of course in casting and in additive manufacturing, depending on the process, you just mentioned the ultrasonics, so it's not so critical, but you usually uh, expose your sensors to very high temperatures and they need to survive that and that's hard. Same in casting, actually. And uh, less in additive manufacturing because uh, the prices of components are high anyway, but uh, more so in um, metal casting. When we come, for example, even to something as common as RFIDs, uh, we are uh, confronted with the fact that people tell us, well, we would like to do it, but we can't because it's too expensive. So if a sensor costs a dollar uh, for a high pressure die casting part, this may already be too much. So low cost, high pressure sensor, uh, high temperature sensors, this will be a great thing for integration in several AM processes and for casting processes too. So if anyone wants to do research on that, very welcome. I second that motion. I was just gonna, gonna say that's uh, great. Hopefully someone uh, that's attending the webinar today as they're thinking about some new areas to explore can um, really dive into that one. So we've been talking a lot about um, sensors and you know, the, design side of things, but maybe if we can kind of um, turn things to a little bit more downstream security in, in when we're thinking about manufacturing. Um, so we've had some questions that have come up uh, from attendees about reverse engineering of parts. Um, you know, that's a, a major concern um, and it's becoming easier and easier. You can do 3D scanning with your phone. Um, you know, there's just lots of technologies that are out there. Um, so what is the possibility for making it more difficult to reverse engineering parts? Can it, does anyone want to comment on that? I would say Dirk should answer that with that authentication slide he showed. Oh, well, maybe, yeah. Um, well, basically, I mean, uh, the easiest thing that comes to mind, and I have to say I'm not a cybersecurity expert, I come from the processes and the materials. Um, if you talk about the 3D scanning with the um, smartphones, for example, and things like that, you're always um, kind of capturing the, the outward geometry of the part. Hmm? So what's hard to, or more hard to capture is, of course, any internal geometry and any kind of authentication devices or so that are hidden below the surface. And also, uh, which is also something you need to consider, which is maybe not um, something that can directly be used for authentication, but uh, you never capture the process actually. Huh? You never capture the, the microstructure, for example, but just the geometry. So this can cause problems, of course, in terms of performance of the parts. It might also provide solutions for providing uh, possibilities for identification and for, well, any measure against counterfeiting. But, yeah, and I, I would add to that. So I know I've seen in my journal a couple of interesting papers in our inaugural issue. Virginia Tech had a, a paper on trying to make unclonable um, stereolithography parts where they put quantum dots, which when they reflect light, change their color based on their size, and they sort of float around in this resin. You solidify it. They lock into this constellation that can't be easily reproduced. You can use computer vision and things like that, maybe if it's transparent to see those items and get this digital fingerprint. There's other cases where I've seen um, where they've done metal parts and actually changed the microstructure in different areas to give it a, a fingerprint, which I thought was fascinating. And even, you know, you can have internal voids that are intentionally there that you might be able to sense with CT scanning to identify, you know, that that's the part you think it is. So. I guess there's a lot of different ways to think about it, but one would be, you know, you think you're getting a part from General Electric, but somebody counterfeits it and, and replaces it, and they might have a latent, you know, defect to cause a problem in your product later, and you want to authenticate that part for that reason. Then just 
counterfeiting because somebody's going to steal your idea and start making a product. That's a harder one maybe, but I guess the authentication would at least allow the customer or the client to identify, you know, to evaluate and prove that that's the part in the, from the source that they, you know, originally intended. Um, but there is, I think 3D printing opens up the door for counterfeiting, but it also uh, opens up the door for some really interesting authentication methods. And I don't think uh, it's been fully explored, but it's certainly I, the focus of a lot of research currently. Yeah, from my, uh, from my experience printing at the Army Research Laboratory is that when we uh, do the, the metal, the laser melting uh, sintering process, we can actually do a, uh, like a double sintering near the surface where the structure is not so critical. Um, the 3D scan will not pick it up unless you section it and put it onto a micro CT, then you can pick up the minute detail on that, of that uh, uh, double sintering. We can double sintering certain area with certain local, you know, that can be only be visible to, it's not to 3D, um, uh, you know, those big uh, scanner, but only to, I uh, might maybe a uh, more expensive scanner, like a micro CT scanner, like a very, very, very uh, high fidelity scanner can be able to resolve. Yeah, so something that's obviously very severely limiting, it's not available to the typical consumer uh, to be able to uh, do the, that uh, type of um, scanning. So that's interesting. And I wanna kind of build on that a little bit with the, the next question. So, yeah, um, and, and this I think goes really to Jian, but how are requirements in the military evolving um, compared to civilian applications uh, for additive manufacturing with embedded sensors? So the military requirements all the the, um, the specification, let's say the temperature survivability, um, it's always a little bit higher than the civilian world. Um, we we got to deal with the uh, long-term storage issue, uh, high humidity, um, high heat, uh, rapid cycling, of course. Uh, you know, you think about the extreme from, you know, one in at the minus 45, uh, 45 degree C, you know, all the way up to the next day, next morning, it's going to be at, you know, 100, 100 degree C you know, in, in a desert condition. So it's a very rapid uh, uh, temperature change. Not only that, um, other than that, then you got to deploy the system where you may experience some kind of extreme uh, G shock or G loading that uh, in better sense, it had to survive. So some of the requirements are always going, going to be a little bit higher than the civilian world. Because uh, we, we only limit a certain uh, application where we see that kind of uh, extreme temperatures. So. Great. And then maybe kind of the flip side of that. Um, so to start thinking about, um, I, I know, I, I don't think we necessarily have any folks with a strong biomedical background, but to the extent that you're aware of additive manufacturing being used in implantable devices, uh, what's really the current state and, you know, and what is the future for um, having sensors embedded in that biomedical application on the consumer side? I can uh, start that. I'm definitely not in the biomedical realm, but I've certainly seen cases where, you know, you'll have an implant like a spinal screw that was 3D printed potentially, and that you can, because you have the freedom of 3D printing, you can add little features that an x-ray can identify. And I've heard people discuss the idea of, well, first off, you know, authentication, but also embedding information about maybe the patient, about the surgery, the day, the condition, you know, things that might be useful to a, a doctor, you know, 10 years later, um, if they had a problem and they, they wanted to sort of a, interrogate the, the implant and find out information about it that could be embedded inside of it, you know. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting aspects. And, and I think biomedical implants are going to be one where you're going to see, yeah, information um, included, you know, embedded in the structure. That's actually been uh, experiments, I know, from um, some uh, well, collection of information that I did, uh, where in, for example, hip implant sensors have been integrated. Um, not necessarily in additive manufactured ones, but this has been done too by now, I believe. 
And uh, of course, well, if you can use wireless techniques to read out the data, that's quite more comfortable for the patient because actually there were solutions which used wires through the skin and things like that, which is of course not so ideal. But uh, of course, if you imagine something like that, um, some possibility of monitoring the performance of um, implants, which may only be temporary, temporary or may not last uh, the full lifetime of the patient. So will have to be replaced at some stage. Then uh, data gathered like that could also be very helpful to design the new implant, for example. So there's a lot of applications for that. And of course, identification is an issue, not only for the implants, but uh, we also had a project where actually the medical instruments used, for example, in an operating theater were um, kind of um, yeah, tagged with RFIDs, uh, integrated RFIDs to make sure that nothing is lost. We all know these cases where some kind of medical device is left within the patient, which of course nobody wants to see. Yeah, one last thing I would say, I know that there's uh, some work out of TU Delft in the Netherlands, Amir Zadpur. He's doing a laser powder bed fusion of magnesium, which I, I believe, I'm, again, I'm not an expert, but it's uh, biodegradable in the body. So you can put metal implants that I think will disappear or biodegrade over time. And um, so there's a lot of fascinating aspects of that that, uh, that certainly could be used to give you information about that. I know that wireless in the body, I mean, I, I haven't done this, but of course we're made of mostly sort of salty liquid, which is not, you know, ideal for electromagnetic communications because it's lossy. Uh, but I do think there are low frequency type, uh, you know, wireless approaches to actually communicate with the implants as well, which is interesting. Great. So I want to take us back a little bit to, um, you know, we were talking about the issues surrounding counterfeiting. And do you guys think that it's a big, it's going to become a bigger problem uh, in, in the future? Or is it one that you feel like eh, it's under control and the adapting of technology, um, you know, things like the QR codes that were discussed earlier, we're going to be able to maintain that or is it something that you're seeing wait maybe we need to um, start to outpace some of the trends that that may be already occurring in in terms of counterfeit um, products or materials and supply chains um, that are already happening so i could start again yeah um, so i think the beauty of additive manufacturing is if you have an aircraft that's 60 years old and there's a component that you need to replace and that business that made it has long since you know gone away. The idea that you could take another part, scan it, and build it, and get a replacement part is really the beauty of additive manufacturing. But the double-edged sword of that is somebody else could do the same thing and and say that it's uh, you know a certified part when it isn't. Uh, I, it's terrifying actually, and and I think that there's no question that we've seen a lot of research where they're trying to figure out how to authenticate it, and that's the main. I think tool that we'll use to avoid those types of counterfeits. I, I, yeah, I think that it's like uh, back in the like 2000 Napster where you could get these MP3s and then the music industry just was basically decimated. Um, it's a concern. Technology is always disruptive and, and I think people have understood that and have identified it and are trying to address it. It's just a tough problem. And well, I should say that right now additive is such a small part of our economy but it's inevitable that this is going to get a bigger and bigger piece as it gets less expensive and the production rates are improved. So um, it's a concern for sure. I would agree to, to what Eric said earlier on that um, it's not only maybe easier to kind of reproduce a part that you know the geometry of, but uh, additive manufacturing also offers more possibilities to counteract this. So. Um, Yes, in a sense, this um, threat is um, increasing, but on the other hand, there are also more handles to, um, to do something against it. So it's kind of a balance and it's just important that uh, the possibilities um, that we have to clearly identify a part and link it, for example, to its production history and things like that, um, that these are developed, these methods. So I think, uh, Maybe that even makes things uh, easier um, because it also fuels uh, the interest in this research topic that in general um, we are more and more tending not only in the aircraft industry but also in other industries 
to um, collect more and more data about parts, about the history they had in production, about the process parameters they saw. So uh, also from that point of view, we have more need to collect data and to closely link it to a part. Um, this is an additional uh, motivation um, to work on the topic of uh, unambiguous identification of individual parts. So this may serve in both directions. So I, I saw a question from uh, from the chat and question and answer about the security uh, implementation or site-specific sample. So right now at uh, AIL, we, we try to curate some of the file, uh, processing file and, uh, and material characterization files that we make sure that is authenticated and to be accessible in future uh, need. And how do we um, make sure that the, these files are junior file and they are uh, progeny, you know, make sure that it's had the authenticity from the creator. Um, this is a big headache for us because right now, you know, you have feedstock information, you have process information, you have cat file information. So in additive manufacturing, I mean, this is new, such a new field that uh, we haven't very thoroughly thought through how do we archive the files and database? How do we curate them? How do we uh, secure them? Um, this is a, 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 a real problem right now. And maybe one other thing I would say that that question sort of prompted me to think about, but in the case of sandcasting, where we're wirelessly transmitting that data, if it's Bluetooth, it's only going like 30 feet. So that's sort of a protection, but there's a balance between, you know, you want the office that might be a quarter of a mile away to collect the data. And there are protocols, the sub one gigahertz uh, radio that you can get now from TI and, and others that with a coin cell battery and a tiny sensor, you can send data five kilometers. And the vulnerability that that, you know, opens up is, is pretty frightening. If somebody, if it's encrypted, you're protected, maybe, maybe not, it's just, it's a concern that we haven't really addressed, but we recognize is a, a big problem in terms of collecting data on, on a manufacturing process that a, a competitor might use to understand your trade secrets or, or so forth. These are concerns that um, are relevant for other manufacturing processes too, aren't they? I mean, we are um, equipping our uh, um, production machines with more and more sensors anyway, and also the collection of data is something that um, affects all production processes. So I'm, I'm really wondering if uh, maybe I didn't get your question wrong, uh, uh, right, but um, is it really so different, uh, the solutions that you can use to um, have store the information that is related to us, an individual part in additive manufacturing when compared to other production processes? Couldn't so, yeah, so um, for additive parts, so usually we only do batch production on certain parts. So you, um, so we had to track individual part rather than just uh, as a, a, a like a large production, right? You 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 maybe pick pick a few representative parts to test, but for additive parts, you you only have one part, and then you you guarantee that part is authentic. So you got to trace all all the way back from the beginning, starting material, because batch to batch powders also there's a variation of it too. So there's a very unique problem of tracking all that file in terms of the cat file. Let's say who manipulated the cat file, right? You may have cat file looks fine in 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 in, in the screen, but you don't know who had manipulated a right? single number or changed certain uh, string of number that makes make the print a little bit different. So that that kind of authentication is very unique because. It's, you got a tremendous amount of data on a single part, not just like on, on a whole uh, process, right? So I think the, um, so the, that's the added layer of challenge is that trace down the authenticity from the beginning to the end for a single part, individual part. So there's going to be a huge amount of data, a huge amount of files to deal with. So yeah, any, any change, any let's say any change through that process, it would change the parts. That's the scary part. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
Yeah. And one uh, comment I would make, and I guess this is uh, looking at some of the new systems that we, if you look about additive manufacturing versus traditional manufacturing, I know Carbon has this great uh, VAT photopolymerization system and they don't sell them, they lease them. And these systems now are, are reporting back to the, the company, you know, how much material is being used and, and things like that. So that's another concern that maybe is different for additive is that many of these systems are, are leased and they continue to connect through the internet to, to the company so that they can at least get statistics on the use. I, I don't think they're getting CAD geometry data because that would be terrible, but they are getting, yeah, usage information. And I think that may become a common model and it's sort of bothersome to me personally. Yeah, that's actually something that's different for additive manufacturing, of course. I mean, um, machines, production equipment uh, connected to the internet and remotely maintained and things like that. Okay, that's common in other areas too, but uh, then you would just get the process uh, data. If I think, for example, a high pressure die casting machine, but you wouldn't know which mold is on it. So uh, it wouldn't tell you so much. But uh, with the um, AM machine, of course, you might even get the, the product model. Yeah, STL files, the G code, which could allow you to. Yeah, actually produce the part. That's, that's of course, a difference. But the other point, the, the collection of data, I mean, there's a lot of research activities now um, developing kind of process ontologies and things like that, which uh, should allow you to um, store and manage information about production processes, parts, materials, for example, in a consistent manner, which could then be taken over, even if the part is individual, from one part to the other. So the, the framework would be there basically for handling and managing the information. So I guess such um, uh, efforts could be taken over, could be used in additive manufacturing too. Great. So I think we've um, had a chance to kind of uh, learn a little bit about uh, some really interesting vulnerabilities that exist in the, in the manufacturing process, um, you know, related to AM in particular. Um, seems to be a lot of different trade-offs, um, things that are design constraints, just considerations um, that need to be made kind of upfront that really kind of takes me back to the idea of training of the workforce and, and trying to teach some of these concepts uh, to the next generation workforce so that as they're coming through the ranks that they're aware of them and that they're maybe thinking through what are the next steps that they can do. So what's the role for educators to make sure that this innovation process keeps happening um, and we're able to stay on top of issues related to counterfeiting, cybersecurity, you know, uh, just general security issues in manufacturing? Gosh, I may be the, the only educator. I guess, Dirk, you're now at a Fraunhofer, so I don't know if you're teaching classes, but it, uh, I'm not in it. Voluntarily, <laughs> not regularly, actually. Well, I'm teaching a class on uh, the introduction to additive manufacturing now, and, and certainly I would infuse um, you know, research in this. It's a graduate level class, so we're definitely talking about the paper from Virginia Tech that had the quantum dots and several others. So it's a, it's a concern, it's, it's definitely in the forefront and it would be a part of you know, any curriculum that I would have on additive manufacturing, without a doubt. So basically um, what you're saying is um, you have to raise awareness of the issue and um, basically teach um, the possibilities uh, that you have to, uh, that there are to counteract the threats. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe, um, one side remark, um, as I was also familiarizing myself a little bit more with the topic here, then um, uh, it can never be a bad thing uh, to also show to persons who, like me, are maybe um, more involved in materials and processes um, the other side of this. Um, like, for example, um, what does a process chain look like uh, from a computer science expert, for example? Hmm? Because uh, cybersecurity is, is not usually something that, um, as a mechanical engineer or material scientist, I would think of. So um, people might not be aware of uh, where are possible points of attack in the manufacturing chain. So maybe raising awareness uh, for this is also important and uh, yeah, valuable point. Yeah, it's definitely an interdisciplinary uh, problem to be solved without a doubt. And yeah, I just showed that I'm using Raspberry Pis, which are 
they're Linux computers, so I'm assuming that the security is pretty solid, but at the same time, they're educational computers. So in many ways, the, the security is sort of maybe disabled, you know, to make them easier for high school students maybe to use. I'm not sure, but it's a good question. And it's, it's an area that I think needs to be focused on for sure. As this new technology begins to flourish, and it will, and it is, and uh, it's just opening the doors to a lot of questions. There's a lot of unanswered questions for sure. So um, I wanted to take just a, a second here at the end and, and kind of think, all right, so we've talked about a uh, range of security risks. Um, you know, they can happen in the, the supply chain, they can happen um, more downstream and, and counter, or, you know, counterfeiting through reverse engineering, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on cybersecurity risks um, necessarily. And I, so I just want to kind of understand what's the landscape um, when we're thinking about cybersecurity issues. We talked a little bit about file types um, and what, what could happen there in terms of some um, IP theft. Um, but are there some other, and we did also talk a little bit about machines and their vulnerabilities. Um, you know, to some, you know, cybersecurity issues. If, you know, it's Bluetooth transmission, maybe not as vulnerable, but if it's on a, a network, um, you know, there are some, some uh, challenges there. Um, but can we just kind of take a minute here to talk a little bit about the range and, um, uh, you know, what, what other things maybe we haven't covered today uh, that if anyone's interested, they can maybe uh, do a little bit of their, their own reading and learning about. I could start with, again, what you saw in those videos that I showed was actually not additive manufacturing. It was additive manufacturing, manufactured enabled, you know, casting, which is a traditional concept. And in that case, it's process data that I, I'm concerned about um, in this specific case, because I'm wirelessly, I have to wirelessly send the data out because I'm, you know, collecting data from a remote and inaccessible location in the mold. And, um, so again, I think that's what I worry about, but I think kind of like Dirk just said, you know, he's a mechanical engineer. I'm an electrical engineer in the mechanical engineering world, but I'm not necessarily a cybersecurity expert. I'm also in a laboratory. So right now it's very much on the vanguard of what we're doing and it hasn't been, you know, widely adopted in industry. Although I can tell you that a lot of corporations are very interested in this process monitoring. Uh, so we're really on the front end of this and it hasn't been thought of enough, but Clearly wireless is a big part of it. It has to be, you've got situations where you can't use wires and that's a vulnerability. And that's what scares me the most right now. And then I think counterfeiting would be the second thing. Uh, I think we've covered both of those. I don't know if I, I don't know what I don't know at this point and I'm worried. It keeps me up at night for sure. Yeah, what, one unique challenge in the Omni application is the RF device has we uh try to print those uh, electronic devices that emit RF and receive RF signals. So uh, you can imagine how one can actually uh, manipulate the print so it only can uh, respond to, to certain uh, uh, radio frequency, not just to our, to, our, to our own frequency. So you can manipulate it so it kind of embedded Trojan where the enemy can actually receive the signal and pass the signal because of the print uh, of certain sensor in there because by now we try to print everything so that's one of the unique uh, uh, problem we uh, we're thinking okay you know if our enemy can hack into our system somehow manipulate the print file to print certain uh, sensor that we don't know about you know so that's kind of unique to the military application okay yeah mm -hmm. uh I believe I've heard about such things uh, being done in IC production, uh, integrated circuits, but uh, again, I'm not an expert in that, but basically, yeah, okay, I mean, you can have different uh, ways of, or different cybersecurity issues, of course, like, for example, um, well, breach of um, confidentiality, it's called, somebody stealing just your knowledge, uh, you can have actually the, the issue of counterfeiting, which you already mentioned, but you can also have the, the issue of sabotage, of course, huh? like um, someone just destroying your product. Uh, yeah, all of them basically uh, 
or can use different points of attack. So all these have to be protected, of course. Eh? So sometimes it's the machine, sometimes it's a tr transfer of data. But in many cases, um, the um, procedures are in principle, as far as I understand it, from a non-computer uh, science point of view, um, similar. So it's an information system which needs to be protected, data which needs to be protected. So um, what is specific to AM is maybe the possibility of integrating uh, identification devices, for example, in the part. But the other things, um, there should be solutions for this, like, um, you know, from other cybersecurity issues. I think we, that's all the time we had today. So I must thank all the panelists, uh, Dirk, Eric, and Gian, and also thank to Justin and TMS uh, for doing a wonderful job for the panel today. I learned a lot and we hope to see you again in future in another event. So thank you very much. We will post yeah. this video on YouTube and send link to all the registered registered attendees. Thank you, Professor. Thanks. Great. This is very cool.